All right, lifestylist friends and family, this is episode 530 with my co-host, Bailey Richardson. And we're going to be doing an Ask Me Anything today based on questions we get from people over the years. And uh, we're going to be talking today about one of my favorite topics, and that is addiction and addiction recovery as someone who has a lot of experience with both. So I have no idea what Bailey's going to ask me today, but I trust that it will elicit some uh, valuable information for anyone that may be suffering from that particular affliction or someone who has a loved one that might be uh, in the bondage of addiction. So let's go ahead and kick it off, Bailey. <laughs> All right. Well, do you want to tell the listeners about um, the bonus episode that we're going to record too? Yes, that's a great idea. So some of you might have heard already that... Uh, <laughs> after um, much deliberation and much hard work trying to figure out how to get this done, we just released, what was that, a couple months ago now we've been at it? Yeah, something like yeah, that. We just no really that. released our first uh, line of merchandise, otherwise known as merch. So we're going to be doing a short mini episode about that and kind of sharing some of our um, excitement about how some of those ideas came to be. But essentially, it goes like this. Um, from time to time, I will be meditating or just taking some creative time and I'll come up with what I think is either a sort of funny or meaningful meme or slogan. And I jot those down. And um, some of them are just so fun, to me at least, they deserve more than just shooting out a tweet or a post on Instagram. So we created a whole line of hoodies, men's and women's t-shirts, and so on, uh, even stuff for kids, some um, drinking vessels, some drinkware, some hats, and uh, they're very indicative in terms of their messaging of the things that we talk about here on the show. So we've been getting some questions about where did this one come from and that one and so on, and so we're going to go ahead and do a mini episode, probably record it right after this and kind of share with you guys where some of those ideas came from and just turn you on to the world that you will find over at lukestorymerch.com. And you can also access that now on our Instagram page, at lukestory. I'd love it if you give us a follow over there. And if you go to my profile on Instagram and just click shop, you'll find the Instagram shop there. So it's been really fun seeing some people finally, as it started to ramp up a bit, posting them wearing their shirts and throwing them on their kids and stuff like that. It's really, it's fun <laughs> as a creative outlet. I think, you know, because of my background, uh, spending 17 years in Hollywood and the fashion industry, which is a whole other story and something I don't talk about a lot because it's not really relevant to the work we do here. But uh, I've always loved making a statement with uh, the clothes that I wear. And up until now, I haven't really found a way to sort of integrate my past experience in the fashion world with the world of the lifestylist and all the things that we cover here. So this was kind of a meeting of those two worlds so that I could uh, let my freak flag fly, as we say on the LukeStoryMerch.com site, <laughs> and, uh, and let other people in the world know what you're all about. I think it's a, you know, oftentimes a great conversation starter when you have a t-shirt that says something that only people in the know would know. And mm -hmm. um, a lot of them are like that. And some of them are a bit on the subversive side. They're freedom oriented. And some of them have to do with plant medicines and some of them chemtrails and all kinds of different stuff. And some of them are just straight up, you know, spiritual messages and, and positive messages at that. So I think we have, uh, God, I don't know how many designs on there now, but um, we're adding more all the time, and um, I'm just excited to share it with people. So thanks for the reminder of that. And we'll be doing a fun little screen share mini episode where we kind of go through that stuff and give people the stories behind the messages. I liked the, uh, you posted one story, and I think you put, I don't know if you did it or someone else did it, they put Dr. Fauci's face on a picture <laughs> oh, yeah. of someone in the shirt. <laughs> someone in our <laughs> telegram. Good. In our Telegram group. Uh, by the way, if you guys want the uncensored social media, it's a bit of a doom scroll over on the Telegram channel, I'll admit, because that's kind of where I dump all of the news and memes and things like that that would get me kicked off the communist censored platforms, like the aforementioned one with the initials IG. Um, so if you go to lukestory.com slash 
Telegram. You can follow our channel there, and and that's where all the kind of adults only content lives. But yeah, how the Fauci and there was a Bill Gates one and a couple other ones. One of the members of our Telegram group, uh, I guess, made those with AI and just took the T-shirts and then put oh. them on. You know, put them on these evil characters. <laughs> I even hesitated <laughs> to post those because I'm like, I don't even want to give those guys energy, but. But they were pretty funny. Yeah, you know, I think funny, one of them yeah. was the um, "I survived the pandemic" and all I got was this stupid T-shirt. <laughs> that was a good one. Bits that one's perfect. probably about running out its timeline by now, right? Because we all want to forget about that. But um, I haven't forgotten. You know what a travesty and shit show that period of time was. And uh, I think part of my rationale in keeping some of that public awareness is I would really prefer if we don't have to go through that or anything like it again. But yeah, that was, mm-hmm. uh, I forget the person's name. So forgive me if that person is listening. I didn't give you a shout out. Um, it's tough to keep track of all the telegram posts, but yeah, he, <laughs> I think it was a, he, he fired off like three or four of those and I was like, these are cool. And so he kept them coming and those are the ones you I saw. I love it. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty funny. Okay. Well, let's get into it. Um, So I think one of my favorite things that you talk about with addiction that I think a lot of people miss the mark on is, um, you know, it's not just about substance abuse and it's not even just about uh, like sex and love addiction or gambling or the the ones that we have the hotline numbers for. Um, So I would love to hear a little bit about how you define addiction. That's a great question. And I would argue that because of the way human beings are wired to avoid pain and pursue pleasure, (laughs) all of us, uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, probably all animals, right? Uh, To some degree, at least primates for sure. I mean, you've seen the videos, I'm sure some people have of the drunk monkeys, you know, that know how to ferment coconuts, then they go get drunk. (laughs) No. (laughs) We got to find that for the show notes. Yeah, just put, I think you would just like do a search of like uh, drunk monkeys and, um, <laughs> you know, they're, they're there somewhere, I'm sure. That's kind so, of incredible. Well, there's kind of a couple pieces, right? There's one just inherent to human beings, which is, as I said, the avoidance of pain and the pursuit of pleasure. But then there's another part of it, and that is that humans, and I guess monkeys too, for that matter, based on that video recommendation, um, enjoy from time to time altered states of consciousness, right? And so there's kind of two pieces. One is the more classical addiction piece. And uh, how I would define addiction, I mean, I could probably do a three-hour show and give you a thousand examples, but to put it simply, I think addiction is when we're participating in a behavior that has proven to have negative consequences and be deleterious to our life and our well-being that we continue to do despite those consequences, A. And B, when we become aware of those consequences, we within ourselves lack the power needed to stop. And so you have kind of a pre-denial stage where the people around someone who's addicted can tell whether it's their phone or overeating, um, as you said, relationships, sex, substances, workaholism, uh, means by which we try to escape the discomfort or the pain we're feeling, or we're seeking something outside of ourselves for more of a full and rich experience of life, like pleasure seeking, right? If everyone in an inner circle of a person thinks that person is addicted to whatever, and that person doesn't think so, there's a pretty good chance that the majority of those people are correct and that the person who is addicted is not. (laughs) And that's the denial phase where that person is doing something continually that's harmful to their life and, and their overall well-being, and they won't admit that it's causing them problems and uh, are in that kind of denial cycle. And then the next phase of it is when even the person who's so afflicted has some degree of awareness that that's the case, 
but still lacks the ability to stop or at least to stay stopped. So in my history of addiction, I was one of those that was very aware that I was an addict, that I was an alcoholic for a long, long time. And I think for the first few years, I just didn't want to stop because I was still, I mean, I wouldn't say I was able to function, that's a stretch, but I was able to suppress the symptoms and the side effects of addiction enough to have some semblance of a life. And and there were times where it was still fun. You know, I'm not going to lie. I mean, when I moved to Hollywood when I was 19 and had zero supervision or restrictions of any kind, uh, I had a lot of fun, you know, playing in rock and roll bands and get got mm-hmm. my fake ID at 19. It was going to all the Hollywood clubs. And for a while there, it was very fun. And then Uh, As we say in recovery, I didn't make this up, but it explains it pretty well. First, it was fun. Then it was fun with problems. And then it was problems with problems. (laughs) Uh, That's kind of how it goes because it's it's progressive. You know, that's the thing with, with true addiction. It's progressive. And the person who is addicted oftentimes doesn't see the progression, but the people around them do. So in short, I think addiction is whether we're seeking pleasure or trying to evade pain, it's something we're doing that is causing harm to ourselves and and those about us, the people that love us. And whether or not we're aware of that, we can't stop. And, you know, some addictions are more acute than others, right? Like I would say, if I'm being totally honest, I'm pretty addicted to my phone. but Phone addiction, sugar, food addiction, sex addictions, things like that are much more insidious and harder to deal with because those things are a normal and natural part of life. So the interesting thing about my phone, for example, I find myself having an awareness when I'm just grabbing my phone for no reason and refreshing apps for no reason. Like, do I really need to Mm -hmm. check my Instagram messages 15 times a day or any of that. No, it's actually not necessary to do my business. But for me to stay connected to the world, it is necessary to use my phone. So I think addictions like that can sort of border on unconscious and then conscious habits. But when it gets into the classical definition of addiction, I would look at something like my phone and say, well, I'm sure it's not adding to my life to be attached Uh, at the hip to the phone, but is it causing me to lose relationships? Um, Is it preventing me from earning a living? Is it affecting my health, my sleep? No. So there's sort of, um, I guess, levels to addiction, right? And and how much damage they're actually causing to our lives. One thing that's been helpful to me, and sugar, you know, I don't know, I'd say I'm probably addicted to sugar because there are times when I am eating sugar and there's a, you know, angel and a devil on each shoulder and the angel's going, you don't need that. Like you don't have to eat a bite of that ice cream because you know, Luke, you're going to finish the whole pint, which I always do. And usually it's like at nighttime, the worst time to probably mm-hmm. eat a pint of sugar and spike yep. your blood sugar and all that. Um, so I have an awareness that I'm doing it but usually I lack the discipline to stop myself once I've, once I've made the decision to do it. But I'm not sitting around all day eating sugar like if I was addicted to cigarettes or heroin or alcohol or many things I've been addicted to in the past. It was like a full-time job and nothing was going to stand in my way and there was no way I could ever titrate or have any sense of discipline. So with some of those things like the phone or ice cream or those things that might veer into the lane of addiction, it's difficult to categorize them. um, And it can only be done so subjectively by applying self-honesty. So am I a little bit addicted to my phone? Yeah. But I'm also able at times to just turn my phone on airplane mode and leave it in the other room and I don't touch it for maybe half a day, right? Or when it gets dark Mm -hmm. out, that's kind of my cue to stop using my phone. Um, are there times when I walk by the freezer and don't pull out the ice cream and eat it? All the time, many times a week. But there are also mm-hmm. a couple of days where I'm like, don't do it, don't do it. I'm like, I'm going to do it. And then I do. You know, and that's, um, I think there's 
kind of degrees to, you know, our attachments or addictions. And, and that's another piece too. It's like you have a dividing line maybe between a habit or an attachment that mm -hmm. wouldn't classically fall under an addiction because if you're given a good enough reason to let go of an attachment, you will. So I might have an attachment at times to my phone, but there's also times where maybe on a Sunday, I'm, I say to myself, you know what, no phone today, and I'm able to achieve that uh, abstinence. So I don't know if <laughs> uh, to answer the short question in a very long-winded way, I don't know if there's one single definition of addiction, and I think it's it's different for each person. And what will determine addiction is the level of self-honesty and self-awareness one has about their behaviors. And the ones, again, that I think are the trickiest are ones that are part of life. In other words, there's no lifestyle for me today wherein you know, it's necessary to take a little bit of heroin every once in a while, you know, or, right. or part of my, you know, health regimen includes having a sh shot of vodka once a week, right? There's just, mm -hmm. it's it's like easy, well, not easy, right? We can get to why it's not easy. It's it's easy for me at this point because of the grace um, that I've received and, and some of the work I've done over the years toward addiction, but um, complete abstinence is much easier with certain habits or addictions or substances because there's no need to ever participate it in your day-to-day -day life. And then there's other things that kind of bleed through where it would be difficult, if not impossible, to apply complete and total abstinence from those behaviors because they're just part of our life. When you talk about the um, the phone and the sugar, something came to my mind about sacrifice. Like, how can, you know, it's a lot harder to see how much we're sacrificing, I think, when it comes to those kinds of addictions or attachments, whatever you want to call them. Like, there are times when I'm around people, maybe in a social setting, and someone, you can, you see those people who are really attached to their phones, and they're like split second interactions that you have with them where there there's an opportunity to connect but instead of connecting they turn away and they look to the phone instead and it's like each of those instances you're sacrificing something um and i think it's tough like you said you don't see the progression it's tough to see those little times that add up um to yeah. make it a pattern and with the sugar too like sugar at night it's like you know that it's not good to eat sugar at night, but what's really going to happen? Like, pra you know, pragmatically, like, are you really going to feel that bad tomorrow, or are you going to feel your cells not working correctly? Like, probably not. Yeah, that's true. I mean, there are degrees of conse consequences, right, with different mm -hmm. habits, addictions, patterns, etc. And I think most of us are willing to tolerate some of the consequences. A, if the consequences aren't that dire, and B, if they're easy to uh, rationalize, <laughs> right? So I might be in a social setting, I'm feeling a little bit of social anxiety, uh, I'm not totally at ease with myself, maybe I don't know the people there that well, etc. There's not a real observable consequence of kind of going into the phone as a means to escape and avoid social interactions or nervousness or whatever the case may be, right? So that makes it all the more important to start to build awareness of the ways in which we're we're trying to escape, right? And there's nothing there's nothing wrong with wanting to escape. And there's nothing wrong with escaping through your phone and there's to me there's no moral issue with escaping with cocaine or whatever, you know. I have no moral judgment against any sort of addiction, habit, pattern what other people do is really truly none of my business. Um, I just mm -hmm. don't care. I care about people, but I don't. I don't care to control other people's lives in that way. But um, some of the more normalized habits and borderline addictions are much harder to catch because no one's really going to call you on it either, right? I mean, unless you've stated to your friend group, for example, "Hey, if you guys see me on my phone when we go to this event." please remind me, tap me on the shoulder and just gently say, hey, you're doing it again. But most people won't do that, right? They'll just kind of go, ah. Oh, yeah. Either they're That's not hard. aware. Yeah, or 
or you do, you don't want your covers pulled and you don't want your you know your mm-hmm. security blanket interrupted right so um, it's actually a good tool to use if you find yourself being habituated to something that doesn't serve you it, it is a really great idea to let your friends or family you know people that are non-judgmental and that truly care about your um, you know, highest good to let them know, hey, I'm working on this thing. Could you give me a little nudge if you see me unconsciously doing it? You know, mm-hmm. thing like sugar could be a great example, right? I might remind Allison if we go out, hey, if you see me, you know, starting to attack the glyphosate laden glutinous cake, gently remind me that I told you I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And then, you, then, of course, you have to be willing to accept that that um, you know, expression of love from the people from whom you ask right. for the help, right? Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, that was on my list. How to? How can we not only build but also utilize our support systems um, when you know maybe maybe we are at the beginning of addiction, or you know, I guess not necessarily the beginning of addiction, but maybe we can feel those attachments getting a little bit stronger than we'd like them to be. Or maybe someone's recovering. They've already gone through addiction um, and they're feeling like, you know, they're feeling like to themselves, but they do have people around them that can help. Well, I think in order to explore that, we have to draw a line in the sand of, Maybe some bad habits, you know, the phone, eating cake, and so on, and a true addiction. So let's start okay. with let's start with true addiction. Uh, this one, I think, in that way, is really tough because when somebody's starting to veer into substance abuse, most of the time they're going to have some level of awareness as they start to slide down that slippery slope, right? They're seeing, oh, I used to only drink on the weekends and now I kind of have a hangover on Monday. So halfway during the day on Monday, you know, I might have a couple beers and so on, right? Or I'm Mm. smoking weed and that's not really supposed to be addictive, but wow, I'm smoking weed all day, every day and I'm missing appointments and being late to work or just, you know, not present. Um, some of the harder street drugs, cocaine, heroin, crystal meth, and so on. When you start to get into abusing substances, especially those that have a lot of um, social stigma around them, in my case, for example, I knew when I was starting to get addicted to drugs like heroin and crack, and I didn't want my friends to know because there was so much shame attached to it. Yeah. I mean, especially with crack, like no one feels proud about being a crack addict, you know? Mm -hmm. Heroin kind of had a little mystique to it because there's some cool people historically, you know, that have been on heroin, Keith Richards, people like that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, there's kind of like something about that particular drug that it's totally false, by the way, it's bullshit. But in my experience, I didn't feel as shameful about that as I did like using crack, for example. Mm -hmm. But regardless of the degree of shame, I wasn't going to tell anyone that cared about me that I was starting to enter the danger zone with those substances, A, because it was embarrassing and shameful, B, because I didn't want to be interrupted, right? If I felt like going on a bender, the last thing I wanted is like my you know, do good or friends tell me, Luke, you better not do that. Right. Cause like once an addict gets it in their head, you're not going to tell anyone that's going to interrupt your flow. Uh, because right. that flow, <laughs> it's a bad word for it, but, uh, because it sounds kind of positive, but, uh, you're numbing your escapism, right? There's a reason why an addict is using that class of drugs and in the beginning, it might be because it's fun and expansive and wild and, you know, it's something kind of new and it can be a really pronounced change of consciousness, so to speak. But after some time, when it starts to get its hooks in you, it's really more about survival and about escaping the pain or the trauma, the PTSD, whatever it is that's underneath that addiction. So if you're uncomfortable in your skin as an addict, and you know the one thing that will help you feel comfortable is to use, 
you're not going to tell anyone around you that could possibly interrupt your ability to create a sense of ease and comfort. That's the last thing you want to do. <laughs> you know? So in terms of support, when someone's truly addicted in the realm of substances, uh, that's where self-honesty comes into play. And as I said, for me, there were years where I, I knew that I was like way past the point of no return. And I could be honest with myself about that, but there was no goddamn way I was going to be honest with anyone else about it unless they were on board with me continuing to do it. Right. Because right? then you, then you <laughs> yeah. get people to co-sign your behavior. You know, you could go ask your junky friends like, hey, do you guys think I have a problem? No, nah, man, you're cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because right. we're all kind yeah. of in the camp together. We're all in that codependency and all of that co-signing and um, justification and denial, but to let anyone else outside your circle of drug buddies, if you, if you have them, uh, which in the end, I didn't really even have drug buddies because I isolated myself uh, to such a degree. I was really just alone all the time because the people mm -hmm. that cared about me found it too depressing and sad to watch me do that to myself and the people that were on board with it were such scoundrels i didn't i didn't want them around <laughs> you know yeah they weren't weren't trustworthy in any way so in terms of being acutely addicted and finding support the self honesty is the most difficult thing to um attain but once one does have some degree of humility and self honesty that's when the chinks in the armor start to appear and the addict, you know, again, going to my subjective experience, you start to get those thoughts. Wow, maybe, maybe I should quit. Maybe there's a way to quit. Um, it seems impossible when you're in the throes of addiction that you could ever feel remotely comfortable in your experience, in your body without drugs and or alcohol. But that little glimmer of hope that it could be possible is really all that it takes. And at that point, and this is a really difficult point for us to get to, us addicts, is to ask for help. And so we can get into that. Going back to some of the things that are more in the realm of attachments or just habits that don't serve us, I think the support can come earlier there because there's not a lot of shame attached to having a problem that almost everyone has, right? So if we're right. talking about, yeah. you know, sex, I mean, at some point in most of our lives, we found ourselves having sex that we regret with people with whom we, you know, would prefer not to interact or, you know, making mistakes and getting ourselves hurt or being selfish and hurting other people. I mean, human beings have a lot of problems with sex. And so that's a pretty universal issue. And some of us outgrow it and sort of mature and some of us never do. Some of us do later in life, which was certainly the case for me. And that's the kind of thing that you could share with a trusted family member or friend, right? Like, wow, I did it again. I had a one night stand. I don't really feel good about it. I'd like to stop doing that. Or you know, whatever your moral compass is kind of guiding you to do. But if you have people that you trust, there's, there's not that much shame associated with it, depending on the level of depravity of your, your uh, adventures, right? Same with, <laughs> you know, sugar, watching too much TV, doom scrolling on the internet, you know, having your phone strapped to your hip and constantly refreshing, 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 checking all the apps. That's the kind of thing that I think is easier to get support with because, you're not going to feel as personally attacked or threatened if people lovingly support you, if you ask for their support, mm -hmm. right? Whereas if you're in full-blown addiction, even if you were to ask for help from someone you know, that cares about you, and maybe in a moment of despair, you kind of like cop to your issue, it's A, really potentially hurtful because you can feel so judged when you did it again and then your loved one calls you on it or you can feel very threatened by that person calling you on it because you associate yourself so closely with that addiction it really becomes kind of part of who you are so if somebody calls out the addiction it can feel like an attack mm. on you right yeah. because the ego gets so 
um, the ego comes to the forefront to such a degree in addiction. And the ego is really the mechanism by which your addiction is protected and hidden. And that's why within circles of recovery, there's so much emphasis on building an awareness of how the ego functions and operates because that is really the main block to sobriety. And so in terms of getting mm -hmm. support, much easier to get support with things that aren't that shameful, aren't that difficult to kind of curtail or manage. But when you get into the realm of like, wow, you are really addicted to a substance, it's going to be difficult to uh, accept the loving criticism of people around you because <laughs> you know, the defenses are so yeah. hardcore. Even if you know mm -hmm. in your heart, man, I'm really in a dangerous place with this and this is really hurting me. The fear of stopping is so powerful, as is the shame that starts to build up over time when you've told yourself, I'm not going to do it again, and then you find yourself doing it again and again and again and again. There's a real compounding of that shame when you're in active addiction. And that's one of the reasons why addicts tend to attempt to at least hide it from the people that love them because they're already ashamed of themselves. They don't need someone else pointing a finger at them, even if they're not doing that, if it just feels like that. Right. Then your shame is affirmed by the people around you that yes, you are a loser. Yes, you are you know, really screwing up. And it's even worse because if an addict is surrounded by people who don't have that propensity and don't have the addictive tendencies, there is no way they will ever understand. Yeah. To someone who's not an addict, who's close to an addict, the solution to them is so obvious. It's just, why don't you just stop? Mm. Just stop. It's so, it's so obvious to them that this person is hurting themselves and probably hurting everyone around them. And if they don't have experience with addiction, it could be, you know, a judge, a cop, a mom, a dad, a wife, a husband, a therapist. Just quit. Just quit using. Can't you see you're hurting yourself? That doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. Yeah. Because those people don't understand what goes on in the physiology and the mindset of someone who's addicted. And that's why and we can get into, you know, rehabs and sober living and 12-step programs and all that. I think that's the main reason why uh, recovery groups are so effective, they're not always effective, but if somebody's really willing to put in the work and commits themselves, as I did, it was very effective for me, it's that an addict will listen to another addict that speaks their language and understands what mm -hmm. they've been through that has found the way out of that hole. What they won't listen to is somebody talking down to them or nagging them or preaching to them. And this is why, historically, religion has not been very effective in curtailing people's addictions because unless that priest or rabbi is a former alcoholic or addict, we won't listen to them. <laughs> it's just noise. It's just white noise. It's somebody nagging us. It's somebody judging us. It's somebody trying to control us. We want to be free and do our thing. I do what I want when I want. There's so much defiance inherent to the, the addict's ego that even if the addict knows it's wrong for them and they should stop, they're never going to listen to someone who hasn't really felt what it feels like to be addicted and to be able to stop. If you haven't walked in those shoes, it's very difficult to tell someone where the path is. I've never experienced personally a serious addiction, but you know, I dated a gambling addict for five years. And it wasn't, um, for me, I could feel the difference between us. It, it wasn't that I was like, why don't you just stop? But I think... I felt really strongly that I couldn't understand him in this way that was like, why can't you ask for help before it happens again? Like, I remember over and over feeling like, you know, I had a feeling that he was going to gamble again or do something that he didn't 
he wasn't going to be proud of or something that was going to hurt our lives. And I would ask him about it and try to check in and, and, you know, show him that I cared about him and that I just want things to be better. Like I'm here to help you. And every single time he would just do it again. And it was like, that was what, that was, I think what hurt me the most is that I tried so hard to be there and I just couldn't understand, you know, why he couldn't connect with me about it. Yeah. But. I forgot to mention gambling. I think just because that's one, <laughs> I feel like I've had just about every addiction on the planet. Gambling is not one of them uh, for me. Personally. Yeah. <laughs> I remember being a kid. It's a and, bad one. <laughs> yeah. Being a kid and going to Vegas and, or not kid, whatever, like in my twenties and you know, pump $20 in a slot machine or something and just be like, uh, this sucks. I just lost $20. I'm out of here. Um, but I have known, <laughs> I have known a couple people with uh, gambling addictions and man, that one is really, really destructive. I mean, talk about levels of shame, right? And, mm-hmm. and, and that really, it's a great example of one of the most tragic things about any kind of addiction is that Underneath all addiction is some some flavor of pain, right? It could be shame, it could be trauma, it could be all of those, but there's definitely shame because every person that's not a sociopath or a psychopath has a conscience, right? And maybe even addicts that are sociopaths and psychopaths have at least this much conscience. But when we're doing something that goes against our base survival instincts, there's usually a part of us to some degree, however might, however dim that awareness might be, that we're doing something against our own best interests, right? And so when you use or when you gamble, it feels very shameful. And the really insidious thing about it is that the way addicts deal with shame is to use. <laughs> And so mm-hmm. you create this vicious cycle. So say in the case of a gambler, and again, I don't have that personal experience, but addiction is kind of addiction at a certain level. So say yeah. I'm a gambling addict and I got five grand in the bank and that's supposed to pay my bills and everything for the next month or two, right? And then I get the obsession of the mind because I'm feeling uncomfortable in my skin and I want to get that rush of like, I'm going to win or I'm going to lose. It's the same rush whether you're going to win or lose, right? It's, the, it's a feeling in the body that says, if I do this thing, I'm going to feel different than I feel right now. Even mm-hmm. if it feels bad, it's better than feeling what I'm feeling, right? So then the mind starts to obsess about going to the casino, for example. I think that's where people do it. You can probably gamble online now for all I know. And yeah. then I fight myself. There's an inner battle. Oh man, what if my wife finds out? What if my friends find out? What am I going to do if I can't pay my rent? If I lose the money? Wow, what if I win though, right? And the mind starts mm-hmm. like, the minute you get the idea, the mind starts like building into this juggernaut of inertia where even if you had the 10 people that love you the most in your life saying, don't do this again. Remember what happened last time? Like we have the evidence right here on your bank statement. Look, (laughs) don't do it. Once an addict gets it in their head that they're going to do it, A, the last thing they're going to do is tell anyone that could possibly get in the way of them doing it because they already decided they're going to do it. Whether it's, you know, done against their own will or not. Because when you're really addicted, like your willpower means nothing. And we can get into that later. But the thing that happens that's so sad is you have that conscious awareness inside, however distant it might be, that, oh man, I really shouldn't do this, but God damn it, I have to do it. And so you feel ashamed that you're going to do it, and then you do the thing, and there's still that part of you that knows you weren't supposed to do it, and you told yourself you weren't going to, and now you've compounded that shame. And so it's this incredibly destructive just such a sad cycle of feeling shame, feeling pain, feeling hurt, trying to numb it or escape it, knowing you did that again. Now you've doubled or tripled or quadrupled the shame and the pain and the hurt underneath the addiction. And there you go. And, you know, this can go on for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, right? If you, if you live that long. Mm -hmm. And so it, it really is, um, 
such a heartbreaking aspect of the human experience. I mean, really acute addiction because the people around you don't understand and no matter how much they love you, they will never understand unless they're a fellow addict that has made it out alive to tell the tale, right? And the weird thing about addiction, and I love love, love hate relationship, uh, watching the show um, Intervention. Oh, and this I is used a, to love that. Show. Oh man, it's a great. It's really a great study on addiction, and mm-hmm. I, I think one of the reasons I like watching it. I mean, not like I watch it all the time, but I've definitely watched seasons of it at different points over the years. Um, a, it reminds me that I don't want to go back there. Mm. Yep. It gives me even more empathy and compassion for people that are still out there in that struggle. Because sometimes I forget because it's been 27 years since I lived like that. So yeah, one of the things that happens when you get sober, especially if you surround yourself around a lot of other people in recovery, which is very necessary in most cases, you think everyone else in the world quit doing drugs because you're not doing it. It's a, it's a weird thing. I remember like when I first got sober, I'd be out somewhere and I'd like smell weed, you know, and I'd go like, what? People still do that? <laughs> you know, I'd be like when I was playing in bands, I'd be out at a club and like you'd run into someone and their eyes are like saucers and you're like, oh, this person's high on Coke. What? People still do that? So you, you just get so removed from it that yeah. you, can't, you think everyone else figured it out by now, right? And obviously they haven't. I mean, we look at the fentanyl crisis in this country. I mean, we're just, it's a shit show mm-hmm. out there. But anyway, back to intervention. So I like, I like to just remind myself that I need to stay on the straight and narrow or I'm going to end up like the person I'm watching uh, as the subject of that show. And I also really love predicting whether or not the person who is being intervened upon is going to surrender. Yeah. And if they're going to allow themselves to be checked into rehab. And if so, are they going to stay sober afterward? Because at, at the end of the show, they're like, oh, you know, J- Jimmy got out of rehab and he's been sober for 18 months, or they give the date, you know, since 2014 right, right. or whatever. And you're like, yes. And I got to say, I'm not bragging, but I'm pretty damn good at predicting <laughs> which addict that gets the intervention is going to stick, you know, and it, yeah. it has to do, there's a certain quality of surrender that takes place when an addict's ego accepts their demise, accepts its demise. There's like a certain, mm-hmm. yeah, there's a certain quality to that moment when they say, okay, mom and dad and brother and sister, all right, I'm going to go. Because there's a really interesting phenomenon that I studied a lot early in my recovery, um, and it's around the principle of surrender. Surrender is something that can't be produced on demand at will. It requires a willingness to allow oneself to surrender, but the act of surrender is actually bestowed upon us by grace. And this is the moment that's so beautiful to watch. When an addict allows their ego to subside for that (laughs) moment sometimes, It's it's a millisecond where they just go, okay, and they admit they're defeated, and they put themselves in the position to receive the gift of surrender. And the gift of surrender is when there's no more fight, right? There's no more, mm-hmm. there's no more defiance. There's no more manipulating and lying to oneself or to other people. And so I love to watch that process unfold because I know the exact moment that it happened for me. And there were successive layers of surrender when, when I had that experience. So A, on that show, I love to watch that. But the point I was really getting to um, in relation to other people, addiction framed in the model of a disease, which I I think it is. It's It's a mental illness. It's a physical illness. It's a spiritual illness. And it is, in the classical sense to me, a dis-ease, a lack of ease, right? It's just there's a malfunction in the system. And The strange thing about the disease of addiction or alcoholism that makes it very unique is that when you have 
an addict at the nucleus of a family, for example, if that family gets in that enabling pattern, which is also something really fascinating to watch on intervention too, because you see like the codependent mom keeps giving the kid money and paying their credit cards mm-hmm. and giving them a place to crash in between binges. And I'm sitting there like, mom, you're killing this kid, you know? And it's a really yeah. difficult place to be. But what's really interesting about addiction and the people around them is if when you, ha- when you have an addict or an alcoholic at the nucleus of a family, unless that family develops boundaries and ultimatums and is aware of codependency and stops enabling them, if they are enabling and they allow the addict to become the center of attention and the nucleus of the family, the phenomenal thing that happens that's so bizarre is that person infects everyone in their entire family or friend circle with the emotional and mental sickness of addiction, even if the other people don't do anything addictive. They all get addicted to fixing that person yep. in codependency. Now, if you look mm. at someone that gets diabetes or cancer or leukemia, whatever, you can have that person who's sick in the nucleus of the family and everyone's attention might be on that person and the family members and loved ones and friends might be concerned and doing everything they can to help that person, but they don't also get leukemia. Everyone else doesn't get sick. Right. They might be stressed, yeah. right? They might be challenged. It might be painful. Um, they might experience all sorts of uncomfortable emotions, but it doesn't infect the entire family system the way that addiction does. And that show intervention, again, is a really great study of, of that phenomenon, how the addict sort of leaks out that spiritual dis-ease into the family. It's almost like, it's like a possession in a way. There's like a dark spirit that takes over the addict or maybe many dark spirits in some cases, probably was the case for me. And it's like everyone gets infected with that dark spiritual energy unless they, you know, are educated about how to deal with someone who's addicted in your family which is a really difficult thing to face because it usually involves in some way or another, um, to some degree, cutting that person off from help because the help, the majority of the time, even though it's well-intentioned and it's coming from love, if you're supporting an addict and them continuing to destroy themselves and ultimately kill themselves, it's kind of a distorted love and that love can get very warped to the point where Mm -hmm. the attempts to love the person in the center of the family who's an addict actually just speed up their demise. And, you know, I haven't had, you know, a child that's an addict. So I, it's easy for me to say like, yeah, you just cut them off. Don't, you know, don't enable them. (laughs) I mean, I know it's very, very difficult to do so. And, and, and I'm sure quite common, um, that a family is healthy and educated on codependency and enabling And they cut the addict off and that addict dies anyway. You know, that's the Mm -hmm. thing. I mean, most people that are true addicts, I mean, this is the crazy thing. Most of us either die or end up on the streets or end up in a mental health facility or in prison. You know, this isn't, it doesn't just go away. When somebody's addicted, you know, to drugs and alcohol, um, it doesn't just get better over time, right? Someone might be abusing drugs and alcohol for a period of time. Maybe they're sowing their wild oats, they're in college, they went through a difficult divorce or lost their job. And, you know, maybe they're self-soothing and kind of medicating themselves for a period of time. But there are many, many people who are able to do that and don't become a full-fledged bona fide addict. Once you've crossed the line and you're an addict, in my experience, and I've known hundreds of other addicts like myself, um, unless you're able to get sober, it's never going to get better. <laughs> it's not something that you like improve over time. It's progressive in its nature. And addiction is progressive even when the addict can't subjectively see that it's progressing. In fact, we're the last ones to know. You know, I remember going back when I first started experimenting with heroin, for example. 
I had no idea that I was addicted until I was way past the point of no return. I mean, I really mm-hmm. thought that I had it under control. It's kind of like you go to the pet store and you buy a little baby boa constrictor and it kind of wraps itself around your finger and it's cute and you can just pull it off. Heroin and, and opiates in general are like an invisible boa constrictor <laughs> that you're feeding and you don't realize how quickly it's growing. And next thing you know, you think it's just going to wrap around you know, your fingers or your forearm and you're going to play with it and it's got your entire body in a chokehold and it is not letting go. Uh, but you don't realize yeah. how quickly it's growing. you know. And that's just mm-hmm. part of the progressive nature. And the, another really weird thing about addiction and alcoholism is that it also progresses even during periods of abstinence. And this has been evidenced to me uh, time and time again, um, being in in recovery groups and someone would come in and they'd be in a really bad way with drugs and alcohol. They'd get sober for six months or two years or five years. And then they would, what we call, go out, meaning they would relapse, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not that they would pick up where they were before they would pick up worse than they were before. Like the addiction has been sort of um, uh, mutating and percolating within their being, even though they've had a period of abstinence. Yeah, so it's like with addiction, if you have a period of sobriety and then you start again, you don't get to go back to the beginning and like hit the first domino again. You go back to the last fallen domino in line and you start from there. And that's one of the things that, I mean, there's so many things that are so tragic about this particular topic. And, uh, you know, I just have so much compassion and empathy for people who are in it and haven't, haven't found a way out because it's just, it's so nasty and it's so destructive, you know, again, not just to the person who's so afflicted, but to everyone around them. It's just, it's insane. You know, I think there is you you talk about the the addict their addiction is progressing but um myself I'm someone who's been close to addicts for most of my life and I think that as the addiction is progressing there's a similar denial going on in you where you're like you don't want to believe that they're as far as they are into it. And then when you realize that they are and you're trying to pull them out of it over and over again, you you definitely become, um, your ego becomes a- addicted to achieving the outcome of them getting better, right? Because you care about them, but also it's just like you can't, let that happen. Like I can't let that happen to them. So then you are seeing this happen to them and, and you get to a point, I think where you're like, they can't do it without me. So then it's even harder to let go. Um, and that's where, you know, it's so hard to, to draw that boundary, to let them go. And my, in my experience, they don't get better until you fully do. Um, you, yeah. the enabling, it's so hard to see while you're in it, but, you know, looking back on it, you can, you can see how encouraging you were by basically taking care of everything that should have crashed for them. Yeah, there's a lot in that particular piece. It's like, my love should be enough for them to want to <laughs> live. <laughs> Yeah. And so it's very easy to personalize the other person, the addict's behavior, right? Because it's like, okay, my love should be enough. If my love is not enough, maybe I'm not enough. So I'm and, just, and I'm just going to love them their harder. love for me. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot. That's what I mean, man. It's, it's crazy how destructive addiction is for the loved ones of the addict. It's, it's I think while you, were, while you were talking about the show, I think 
completely subconsciously because I used to watch that, what, maybe 10 years ago, like when it was in its first few seasons. And um, I think maybe I was watching it because I related to the family members so much. Uh, Maybe I was trying to learn how to draw that boundary or how to, you know, get someone out of it. Yeah. Well, another thing about the codependency is <laughs> it's pretty likely that if a non addict person gravitates toward an addict, even if they weren't one at first, they're still going to have that obsessive compulsive sort of energy, right? Even if they haven't landed on their drug of choice and really gone off the deep end with it. Sure. There's a certain, yeah. there's a certain draw to a type of person who has a fixer energy, right? The codependent. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes the codependent who is setting about to rescue the addict has their own unhealed trauma, PTSD, pain, shame, and they might not get the same type of relief or avoidance or escape that the addict does using substances, but they're wired in a very similar way. And what they use to self-medicate is taking the focus off themselves and the things that they need to heal and address and putting all of their focus and attention on the addict as a diversion Mm-hmm. to evade the shit that they need to work on, right? So it's like... It, it's the perfect escape. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's also very insidious because on the surface, it looks like you're a really kind and caring person who is doing everything they can to help someone that they love. But hidden mm-hmm. underneath that sometimes, maybe a lot of the time, is a more hidden, subversive, type of escapism that's becoming addicted to that person as a means of escape rather than joining them in escaping through the use of substances. So it's like you have Mm -hmm. two addicts really in a codependent relationship of that nature. And the one who is not using and drinking kind of gets off scot-free because it's, it's much harder to see their behavior, but it has a very similar effect right? Your life just yeah. completely goes to shit. Um, mm-hmm. The unmanageability, the chaos, the drama, all of those things that come from the futile attempt to fix and regulate and, and save an addict. Now, the, the difficulty here that I alluded to before is for the loved one of an addict, knowing when and where and how to draw the line right and this is you know something that's really beautiful to watch on the show intervention too is you see the the therapist and the experts in addiction recovery 90% of the time they send the whole family to codependency rehab too oh that's great yeah which yeah, is cuz they know it's not going to stick if you have a sick family that's been infected with codependency and addiction and maybe the addict has a very sincere surrender at depth and they avail themselves to the help that's being offered. As ex-addicts and experts on the subject, uh, the counselors and therapists and so on, know that even if that person goes to rehab and gets sober, if they come back out into that sick family dynamic, their chances of staying sober are slim to none. Because the family will get the addict sick again because they haven't healed themselves. Yeah. So it's really interesting to watch, you know, the expertise. And, you know, many people, you don't have to watch the show to just kind of understand how that works. I'm sure there's people um, listening that have had an addict in their family or they were the addict and so on. And you can see this demonstrated in, in real time. But I think it's, it's really important for the whole family unit or the whole friend group to become educated and, and commit to their own recovery because in that dynamic, everyone's sick. It's just easier to hide the sickness of the enablers because on the surface, it looks like they're being of service and expressing their love in the best way they know how. And I'll give you a story about um, one experience that I had with, uh, with that sort of tough love that thankfully went well. <laughs> you know, it doesn't always go well. As I said, some people 
you know, are healthy enough to cut off their enabling and then that person doesn't make it. Um, many years ago, guys, I have to ask my brother Cody how long he's been sober, but I was maybe, I don't know, five or six years sober back in early 2000s. And my brother Cody, I hope he hears this someday because I love you, man. I love my brother. He's such a sweetheart. He was like a little, um, like he was a rapper. He was like a little gangster. You know, he carried guns <laughs> and, you know, it was just very, uh, like an Eminem kind of character, right? And just doing all kinds of dark shit and involved in crime and violence, you know, a lot of violence. And that was never my lane, you know, I'm a lover, not a fighter. So even when I was on drugs, like I never got in a fight. I never had any problems like that. Um, but Cody was a tough customer, you know, he, his way of coping with his childhood and things that he went through was through aggression and violence and extroversion, right? And mine was more about like receding and cowering and hiding and introversion. We all kind of have our personality types. So anyway, I'm living in LA. I'm sober. I'm living with our other brother, Andy, who's just like a normal guy. He's just, I don't know. I've seen him drink a beer like three times. He just doesn't seem to have that tendency. <laughs> and we were roommates and my brother Cody decides to move to California. And he gets out to California and he's up to the same shenanigans he was in Colorado where he was from and finds himself in you know, this apartment out in the valley. He gets in a conflict with some drug dealers who break into his apartment one day when he's in there to, uh, to beat him up or rob him or whatever. And mm -hmm. he's asleep. He wakes up. He's got his gun. Thankfully, he doesn't shoot anyone, but pistol whips the guy, knocks him down the stairs, drags him outside. This whole shit show, like drug addict, drug yeah. dealer, hood rat drama. So mm -hmm. he gets kicked out of his apartment, of course. The cops come. It's a whole thing. So he comes over and is like, told me what happened. And I'm like, sober. I mean, I'm going to meetings three times a day. Like, I don't hang around anyone in that world at all anymore. I, I let go of all my friends when I got, well, you know, my quote unquote friends. Right. You know, and some of them were, you know, but they were drug buddy friends nonetheless. So I had surrounded myself with sober people. There was no drama, none of that in my life, no crime, none of that weird stuff. So he comes over, told me what happened. And he's like, yo, I don't have a place to live now. I'm going to have to sleep in my car. Can I come live with you guys or stay with you for a while until I get back on my feet? And thankfully at that time, I had enough wisdom and understanding about the nature of these things that as much as it broke my heart, I just told him, no, man. You know, I said, Cody, God, I love you, but I'm sober. I can't have this kind of energy around my, my house. And he was so pissed off, man. I mean, he hated me. Yeah. And I found out years later that my other brother, Andy, and Andy, if you ever hear this, you little shit, he and Andy are full brothers and I'm, I'm a half with both of them, right? We have different mom. And mm -hmm. so, uh, so they're really tight. They're, you know, similar in age and grew up together. I didn't grow up with them. They're 12 and eight years younger than I. So, you know, we weren't as close, but Andy wasn't as well-versed in enabling and codependency and stuff. So Andy told Cody how to get up on the roof of my apartment and, and Cody went up there and was just like <laughs> camping up there basically and lived on our roof unbeknownst to me for a while. <laughs> and then, you know, in typical addict fashion, it was all my fault. I'm the dick big brother who won't, you know, I don't care about him. I won't help him out. He's in a bad spot, et cetera. And I just had to kind of take the arrows and be willing to be hated by someone that I really loved because a, I knew it would mm -hmm. hurt me to have him in my environment. I wasn't trying to get pistol whipped and have all this like coke dealer drama in my house. Um, so it's self-preservation, but I also knew that it wouldn't be doing him any favors to make it easier for him to continue living the life that he was living. So he hates my guts. I'm the worst brother ever. He won't talk to me. He, you know, he basically like cut me off, right, of communication while he's sleeping up on the roof of my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, without my knowledge, uh, which I didn't find out till quite some time later. Anyway, long story short, a few months go by. He softens up a little bit. 
and calls me one day and asks for advice about his predicament. And this is going to sound weird to some people listening, but he was starting to um, like take pills and stuff and was finding himself having some problems in that realm, which if you get into opiates, it's, you know, you're talking physical addiction, which is a whole other animal than just like mm-hmm. doing Coke on the weekends when you go out drinking with your buddies. You know, when you get into the opiate game, and it's it gets real gnarly and real dark. So you're like, Losing time too. Yeah. And the quitting is just, it's almost impossible to do on your own because it's just so painful. So anyway, my advice to him, as I recall, and he could probably correct me on the details of this, but he probably thought I was going to say, Cody, you're an addict. You need to get sober. You need to quit doing drugs. And my advice to him was, you're probably not doing enough drugs because (laughs) if you were... You could hit the end of your run a lot faster. <laughs> and that was because you have to hit bottom. And I knew right. he, he, yeah, just because he called me as a sober older brother, that's not hitting bottom, like saying, hey, I'm kind of having a problem. Calling me and saying, hey, can you take me to a meeting right now? Now we're talking. He wasn't there. He's like still thinking he can kind of manage it and control it. He's just, it's getting a little squirrely with the pills. Like, what should I do? And the essence of my message was like, take more pills. Which, you know, some would consider reckless, but that was what I was guided to share with him because I knew if I put myself in the enemy camp of just another person trying to tell him what to do and shaming him for his Mm -hmm. decisions that then I would never be able to get through to him. I would be put in the category of people that you don't ask for help because they're going to put the kibosh on your shenanigans. So I said, man, no judgment, but you got to hit a bottom. Otherwise you're never going to get sober. So if, if using more is what it's going to take to hit a bottom, then that's what you do. Anyway, won't let him stay at my apartment, tell him do more drugs. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I have my own way of articulating that idea, but that was the essence of it. And and he got it. Right. He, he understood. He understood. And um, anyway, so a few months go by. One day he calls me and he says, man, I'm really, really hurting. You know, can I come hang out with you and your sober buddies and go to one of those meetings? Wow. Yeah. He surrendered. He Mm -hmm. hit bottom. He hit bottom. He surrendered. And that was the call I was waiting for. And so he did. We did. And now he's still sober. I don't know, 15 years, whatever it is. You know, I don't even count anymore. Has a beautiful baby, a wife. He's got his own business. He's um, got just immovable integrity. And um, moral character, which doesn't just happen from abstinence, by the way. When that's a whole other, God's probably a whole other podcast. But not only did he stay sober, but through the grace of God and his commitment to himself, he really transformed his entire life. He's just a completely different person, right? And sometime afterward, Actually, he's shared this with me many times. He thanked me for not letting him come live at my house. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, directly, straight up. Thank you so much for not helping me. Because it mm-hmm. it facilitated the reality check he needed to then later call me and say, okay, will you help me? You know, will you take me to a meeting? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that could have gone the other way. And I knew that, right? I could have told him, oh, you need to hit a bottom. Like, just go nuts with the drugs. Like, if you're going to do it, do it. If not, stop. And no, you're not staying at my house. It could have very easily, I mean, I was flipping a coin and it could have been, Yeah. those could have been decisions or or statements that I regretted for the rest of my life. But I, I just felt in my heart that that was, the most wise path to take on my behalf. And luckily for me, it it worked out. 
as I hoped it would, you know. But for mm-hmm. for many, it doesn't, right? You, you you do what you think is the the highest service to the addict, and you you don't enable them, and you create boundaries and apply tough love. And and sometimes it doesn't go that way. Sometimes they don't make it. You know, there's all sorts of considerations between destiny, fate, karma, luck. I don't know. You know, it's funny, Bailey. Sometimes I think about. I've had this experience in in quite a few um, psychedelic uh, ceremonies and whatnot. I sense that I was an alcoholic in a number of lifetimes before, and I couldn't get it. Mm. I couldn't get it. Meaning, um, I couldn't. I couldn't stop. Fix it. Yeah, I couldn't stop. Uh huh. And. For some reason, in this lifetime, even when I was in the depths of addiction, (laughs) there was this very dim light in the background that let me know that my life could be bigger than that and that it wasn't wasn't Mm -hmm. supposed to go this way. You know what I mean? Some addicts just resign themselves. Yeah. Like, ah, fuck my life. FML, you know, it's just like, I'm done. And they just kind of resign themselves to a life of misery and pain and, and ultimately their demise. And there was just something in me. And it's not even, it's like not something I can take credit for because I think it was that little seed, even though I ignored it for decades, it was there and it was maybe a combination of my higher self, my eternal self, God saying, hey man, you got another shot this time. And I feel like hmm. this was the lifetime where I was given enough of that awareness where I eventually, and it took, like I said, a very long time, I just grabbed on to that. But it also gives me a lot, that perspective of just, that I've probably failed at this many times (laughs) also gives me that much more empathy for people who never have the impetus to even try to quit or get sober or acknowledge to themselves that they have a problem. Like I have no judgment against addicts because I'm pretty certain that I was one quite a few times and just Mm. wrote it out until the bitter end and then came back and did it again and again and again. And for some reason this time I was like, all right, I'm dealing with this shit this time. And, and, you know, through the grace of God I have, but it's it's just a sad reality that, um, some addicts are just going to die. Hmm. Well, I'm glad you got off the wheel this time. Oh my God. I mean, what a gift. You know, it's, it's, thankfully, it has never been a gift that I've taken for granted. Mm. You know, I just, yeah, it's, it's a weird thing, you know, because as I gain a, I think a greater understanding of, uh, the fallacy of time, right? That there's (laughs) not, there's not a moment in the past and not a moment in the future and a moment now. Time is not linear, right? We hear, oh, time is a construct. And it's like kind of, you can just sort of throw that out there. But in my experience, there really is just one eternal moment. And this, I think, took me some years to understand why the experience of being an addict is so visceral and so immediate in my awareness I mean, I can feel it, touch it, taste it, see it, smell it. I mean, I remember those moments of just absolute despair and desperation and depravity and shame and just, ah, uh, all of it like it was five minutes ago. And at the very same time, it's like it was another person. In right. another lifetime altogether. And that was never me. Yeah. Or that it was yeah. ages and ages and ages ago. And I think because you would never my, do that. Yeah, yeah. I think because my relationship with time has evolved over the years that it really all is happening 
in this moment. This moment sitting here with you right now is just a different vantage point on the moment when I was crawling around on the carpet, smoking plastic, hoping it was a rock of crack, you know, or (laughs) drywall and shit. I mean, honestly, it was just so, so grim, so depressing. And I'm so grateful that I have that 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 awareness and that tangible relationship with what we would call the past because i never forget how dark it was even though even though in 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 the realm of clock and calendar time it was 27 years ago to me in my subjective subjective experience it's right now i mean i can go back there like that Mm -hmm. i don't spend time there But knowing how close it is and knowing that the gift I received is in many ways an unearned, I don't want to say undeserved because I think we all deserve the grace of God, but literally the only thing I did to facilitate my initial sobriety was just humble myself a bit and avail myself to the help uh, that I needed. And literally, God did the rest, you know? And then I put in Mm -hmm. a lot of work for, no, I'm still putting in work in in, in my own uh, different ways. But in terms of committing to my recovery, I mean, again, there was something in me. And I just thought, man, this, this is my only shot at this. And if I don't seize this opportunity, it might never happen again. And that's also one of the things, I mean, I never have a thought like, Oh, I'd love to have some whiskey or do a little heroin. <laughs> like I just, I'm not in that kind of pain where I'm seeking yeah. relief like that. But if I ever did have the idea, my insurance policy is that there is absolutely no way that I can guarantee that I wouldn't end up in the exact same spot I was at 26 years old by next week. And I'm quite Mm -hmm. certain that if I were to start again, it would be worse than ever. And what's even more terrifying is that there's absolutely no guarantee that God would enter my life like God did the first time and completely Mm -hmm. annihilate my cravings and obsession about using drugs and alcohol. And And that's what happened for me. It just, it went away in a flash. Because I prayed for it. Um, I prayed for that gift in a, yeah. in, in a really <laughs> in earnest, you know, just with, without reservations. I really turned my life over to the care of God as I understood God, which was zero, no faith, <laughs> no belief, nothing. Right. Just, right. just, a, a, a bit of awareness that that's kind of how this thing works. You know how recovery works is it's it's a thing that God has to help yeah. you with, and the, that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah, that's what they told me to do in rehab, literally. Right. I I, I remember mm-hmm. I went to the nurse's office because they take your vitals and stuff when you come in to make sure you don't croak, right? And I went in there and I was really <laughs> in a bad way, and I asked the nurse, maybe they give me a physical or something. You know, can I get some medication? Like, can I get some Dilaudid or you know? Something yeah. to, you know, Some relief help me here. feel a little more comfortable. And they they took my vitals yeah. and they said, actually, you, you seem fine physically, so we're we're not we're not willing to do that. And um, she told me to go to my room and to pray to God. And that was the only tool or solution uh, I was offered. And so that's what I did. You know, Mm -hmm. and the rest the rest is history. And the cool thing about that is it was it was like a multifaceted gift because I didn't think it was gonna work. I didn't believe in God, I wasn't religious, I wasn't spiritual. I guess you you could have classified me as um an agnostic, maybe not atheist, because I wasn't like anti God. I just was unaware, I was unlearned, I was unknowing. It seemed very unlikely that that would work. And the beauty of it is that even though I didn't believe in God, because I humbled myself and and asked for God's help, God still helped me. And (laughs) the coolest thing about that is that 
I recognized immediately that something in me had changed and it was something that I alone could have absolutely never changed myself. It was immediate. Yeah. And so I was given proof um, that I couldn't dispute. There was no rationalizing how one day, you know, I'm checking into rehab, shotgunning beers and joints in the parking lot when my mom dropped me off to the point where they wouldn't, they were like, not going to let me in because it was like midnight or something. And they're like, if you don't get him in here right now, talking to my mom in the parking lot, he's not getting in. So I check in. I mean, I literally could not. I had to drink up to the door of the rehab. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah. In the parking lot. I'm just like, I got to right. get it all in because I knew it was going to be the last one ever for some reason. And um, so to go from that guy to the very next day, knowing that it was over, was absolute proof that something other than myself had entered into my field and um and and saved me i mean it's like literally it's like a religious conversion i was saved you know i turned my life to jesus and i was saved i mean i literally i mean i wasn't talking to jesus i was just talking to god in yeah, general but god i was mm -hmm. very literally saved in the truest sense of the word and, <laughs> and released from bondage you know and so oh. um i just place such a high value on that gift that I just feel like I could never smack the hand that feeds and tempt fate, no matter how difficult life has been or how uncomfortable I've been at times or just things that I've had to work through in my sobriety. It's just, there's just a hard line as far as that goes that I, I don't think that I'll ever cross. God is good. <laughs> oh man, it's wild. I mean, isn't that some shit though? That, <laughs> that you don't have to believe in God uh, yeah. for God to help you, right? That's, I mean, think well, about that. That's a trip, you know, for anyone who's an atheist or agnostic listening that might be having some difficulties in life. It's so hard to fathom that prayer is a real technology that is provable, reliable, verifiable. And there's mm -hmm. no way I would believe that if it had not worked for me thousands of times. And I still forget, even having an abundance of empirical evidence to support that fact, I still try to figure my life out and solve my own problems all the time. And sometimes oh, yeah. the last thing I think of is like, oh, there's this benevolent, all-knowing, <laughs> omniscient, omnipotent <laughs> power in the universe that... Mm -hmm wants the highest good for me and won't interfere with my free will, which is also another beautiful gift that our creator gives us, right? It's like God doesn't just mm -hmm. intervene in your life, I think, unless there's an invitation of some kind, right? So this intelligence, this loving being that we call God is just kind of chilling, allowing me to stray as far as I want to stray from, from it. And the moment I say, hey, oops, I screwed up. I want to come back. I'm instantly back. I might not feel instantly mm -hmm. back, but I'm I'm back in the grace as soon as I decide that I want to be and that I'm willing to be. You know, it's really it's incredible. Mm. I love that so much. It's so much of our life is, I think, uh, restricted to what we believe. Um, so many of our outcomes, we can really only get them if we believe that they're possible, but. That seems to be like a very important mechanism of the surrender is and of the rock bottom. It's like you go so far that you just it's almost like you let your beliefs go. What you believe doesn't matter because you're gonna die if you don't get his help. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's get true. back in the grace. That's true. I mean, that's the beautiful thing about hitting bottom if you live to tell the tale. You know, the humility that comes from truly hitting a bottom. And I think that's another thing, too, that kind of prolonged my addiction was I was always kind of waiting till that other shoe dropped. Like, I remember thinking, well, if I get evicted from my apartment, 
which <laughs> I, I I wish I would have collected them, but I used to have a stack of eviction notices. You know, they would come and <laughs> tack it to the door of my apartment. My rent was four hundred and fifty dollars oh. in the studio apartment <laughs> behind the Chinese theater, and I couldn't pay it. You know, because yeah. I was unemployable. But anyway, I thought, okay, if I get you know uh, beat up badly, um, you know, get robbed or knived or shot. Uh, if I get arrested, if I go to jail or end up going to prison because I was dealing drugs, so that was a very likely possibility. Um, you know, if my, I don't know, maybe if my family totally disowned me, I was, I was just thinking about, okay, if, if and when, more when than if, the worst case scenario happens to me, then I'll get sober. Because mm-hmm. I knew that I would need to hit a bottom. And so I always perceived the bottom as being some external pressure that would at some point be applied based on the decisions that I was making for my life. And what ended up happening was, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't winning at life, trust me, but there, there was never like an acute moment like that where I did get beat up or, you know, just have something really horrible happen, crash a car, get a DUI. Like I never got a DUI because I couldn't even afford to get a car for many years. Um, (laughs) It was kind of a a blessing um, in disguise. But I think people think of a bottom as the divorce, losing your career, losing your job, the car accident, the arrest, going to jail. Those are just external symptoms of how unmanageable one's inner thought and feeling life has become to where their decision-making capacity is so hindered that they start to get really sloppy and stupid and do things consciously or unconsciously that put themselves in harm's way. So we think of a bottom as an event in life that happens that is objectively so bad that it causes the addict to wake up. Mm -hmm. My view on hitting bottom is it's an internal phenomenon that can happen even when all of the pieces in your life in a material sense, are still intact. You still have your kids. You still have the marriage. You, you might have money. You might still have a company or a career, or a good job. Nothing's fallen apart. But inside, you know that you're about to or have crossed the Rubicon of not caring if you're here anymore. And that living seems so much more painful than just throwing in the towel and being willing to die, right? It's like an internal hopelessness at depth where just no matter what's going on in one's external life, the sense of pain and shame and all of those festering emotions and the agony of living with a chaotic, out-of-control mind and thinking world becomes so painful that you hit that bottom on the inside. And it's a really, it's quite a beautiful thing, um, albeit tragic, that with some level of self-honesty and self-awareness, someone can hit bottom without their entire external life imploding on them. You know, it's, it's a felt sense that I can't allow things to get any worse than this. And that's how it was for me. And, and also there was... Now that I think about it, there was a sense of impending doom. And I always think Mm -hmm. about it like um, in the cartoons, you'll see a little canoe going down a river and it's about to go over a deadly waterfall. And they're trying to like paddle to the Mm -hmm. shore and paddle to the shore. And then you can see as the viewer, oh man, they're about to go over the waterfall. That's the kind of feeling, for lack of a better analogy, that's the feeling I had. I was like, I think I'm pretty close to being a victim of violence or car accident or being arrested, going to prison. Like I felt like that was right around the corner. But thankfully, the internal hitting bottom, the emotional darkness and hopelessness that I felt was enough to nudge me into that surrender without actually having some of those physical manifestations transpire. As you were describing that, not I d- and I don't want to diminish the experience of an actual addict, but if I didn't know the situation that you were talking about, I could have believed that you were talking about the codependent relationship with the addict, the the feeling of impending doom and the um, 
you know, you said, I can't let this go on anymore. It's like, you don't know when it's going to happen. Oh, and, and the part, you know, where you're like, oh, well, if I get evicted, then I'll do it. If, if it gets really, really bad and it's actually impossible for me to keep going in this relationship, then I'll break up with him or then I'll cut them off. And um, yeah, it's like, they're so similar. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, codependency in, I mean, it has a lot of permutations, but I would say broadly speaking, codependency is when you're addicted to another person. So you True. you are experiencing that phenomenon of moving the goalposts, right? Uh, this mm-hmm. thing was bad. He really screwed up. He came home drunk again. He got a DUI. He went and gambled all of our money away, whatever it is, right? And you're like, I'm going to give him one more shot. And then if if this mm-hmm. happens, I'm out, right? And then it happens, yeah. of course. And then you're like, all right, well, I'm pretty pissed, <laughs> I'm pretty hurt, but I, there's hope. I know if I just love them harder... <laughs> They're going to love yeah. me enough. They're going to feel my love and they're going to stop this behavior. And we keep moving that goalpost, you know, further down the road until we internally have our own bottom as the person who's being infected with that person's addiction, you know, to the point where it's spreading to us and we're now addicted to solving their problems and feeding off the drama that they create in our relationship and in our lives. Yeah. And I, I think you, you know, you can see they're going over the cliff like right before you. And there's a point where you ask yourself like, how far am I going to follow them? Am I going to follow them all the way down and then be there to pick them back up? Or should I get off this ride now? <laughs> you know, yeah. Can I do that? Save myself. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we trick ourselves into thinking it's just some rapids not a waterfall, right? <laughs> yes. Just, we just got to get through this rough stretch of the river here. Yes. You know, delude ourselves. I mean, that's the thing, you know, the human mind has such a incredible uh, capacity for self-deception. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's just, it's one of our coping mechanisms, right? Where we're able to justify our life situation in a way that allows us to, to, continue on the path that in the immediate is seemingly safer than pulling mm-hmm. the plug, which seems disastrous in many cases. And we can, we can fool ourselves into believing the most outlandish bullshit to keep ourselves from ripping the Band-Aid <laughs> off of whatever it is that we're going yeah. through, right? Whether we're the addict or we're the one that's enabling the addict, it's really difficult to make a firm decision to hop out of the river, you know, when mm-hmm. it's really time. And, and that's another really beautiful principle from recovery, a principle that's very prominent in the teachings of the 12 steps of which I'm a huge fan. And that's just like what I'm made of at this point in my life are those principles. Not that they belong to the 12 steps, but they were just codified in a way that's unique to uh, addiction in the 12 steps. And one of them is making a decision. A decision is the prerequisite for anything ever changing in your life. It's like, imagine right now, if I want to come visit you in Florida, we can talk about it till the cows come home. We can talk about it all day long. Yep, I'm going to come down to Florida, Bailey. I need to get some sun and some palm trees, see the beach, see the ocean. I'm definitely going to do it. And we'll talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. Once I make Mm -hmm. a decision that I'm coming to Florida, that sets the rest of the plan in motion. Once that decision's made, I'm looking at flights, I'm looking at hotels, I'm going to buy the flight, I'm going to reserve the hotel. Now something's happening that would have Mm -hmm. never happened had I not made the decision. And that is a a principle in step three. We made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. You don't just turn your life over to God. You can't do that. It's too big. But you can make a decision to do so. And in making the decision to do so, (laughs) come the actions that follow. And in the case of the 12 steps, the actions that follow are working your way through the remaining steps. Yeah, the remaining nine, I guess, would be left after three, something like that. Mm-hmm. Math is not my strong suit. But what I'm saying <laughs> is it's a beautiful principle that each decision takes us to the next inflection point of action. And then we have more decisions to make. But without the decision, 
it's all just hot air. Yep. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I think we should do a part two for this one. I love it. I've got a couple more questions and uh yeah. Well yeah, I, we'll do that. I love it. It's funny because whenever you kind of throw the topics on me, I swear to God, every time I'm like, ah, I don't know. Do I I don't really know if I can fill the the episode. Do I really have enough to say about <laughs> that? You, know, you have a good knack of like picking great questions from our our listeners and our Facebook group oh, and stuff. Good. And yeah, it just takes a couple uh-huh. prompts and I'm like, ooh, I really want to share this, you know, because part of uh part of how I get to keep enjoying the life I do free of addiction is by being of service. I mean, that's really at this point, probably the main way, but uh, because I've situated mm. my career and my life in the way that I have, I don't often get the direct experience of really working with guys, which I did for a long time um, in the role of a sponsor. You know, I really boots on the ground, like with my brother Cody, for example, you know, having someone like that that is newer on the path of sobriety and really getting to help guide them as so many beautiful men guided me um, early in my journey. So I'd, I kind of miss that experience of talking about this stuff and really sharing my experience. And and as I said earlier, I kind of forget that there's still people out there dealing with this, right? I just, I'm yeah. not around them. Uh-huh. So I kind of just forget that this is such an important message to share, you know, that there is, there's not only hope because hope sounds kind of, kind of weak in a way. It's like you can have hope and still nothing happens for you. So what I would say yeah. beyond that is if anyone's listening and they're struggling with this or know someone that is, it's not that there is hope because there's always hope for everything. Everything's in constant change and flux and the potentiality of all reality is infinite, right? So of course there's hope. But beyond that, what's perhaps more powerful and tangible is that there is a solution. There is a solution Mm. to addiction. There's a few, but (laughs) I know the solution that worked for me and that was checking my ass into rehab doing everything that I was told to the best of my ability and following my aftercare program, which was like immersing myself into uh, recovery groups for a very, very long time in a, in a mm. super uh, earnest, committed fashion, which is not because I'm, you know, have some kind of moral... Um, advantage. I just really wanted to live, and I understood that that's how that was going to happen. <laughs> you know, so and I you have to fill your life with it. Yeah, so I availed myself yeah. to it. There's a, there's a um, a statement in the book Alcoholics Anonymous that says half measures availed us nothing, which is a really powerful principle. So it doesn't say that half measures avail us half results. It says that half measures, speaking mm-hmm. of committing oneself to recovery, half measures mm-hmm. availed us nothing. Like you literally get nothing okay. for putting in half of the work toward your recovery. It doesn't, it's either, <laughs> you know, you commit yeah, yourself fully and then you get the whole thing or there's, there's no option mm-hmm. B. It's option A only or else best of luck. You, you're going to be mm-hmm. availed nothing. And another beautiful one, and I swear I'll close with this, Because that sounds pretty demanding. Another really beautiful spiritual principle that applies to addiction is that we're aiming for progress, not perfection. You know, and that makes the goal unreachable and at the same time attainable. It's like, hey, as long as I'm making progress and I'm giving full measures toward that progress, knowing that there's not a destination at which I'm going to arrive as a finished product, right? It's always a work in progress. We're making progress toward perfection, but we're not setting the unrealistic expectation upon ourselves that we should be perfect at any moment or any time soon. Maybe we're never perfect Mm -hmm. until we leave our body and we're not encumbered by the animal instincts and the ego and the intellect and all those things that are part of the human experience as a whole. So while we're here, yeah, yeah, while we're here, we just have to aim toward progress. And just mm-hmm. put our heart and soul into making progress and be gentle with ourselves when we make mistakes. Yeah, and that's for everybody. You know, true it's that. every day. Every, everybody. Yeah, true that. All right. 
Well, thank you, Bailey. I love doing these AMAs. I always kind of dread it because I have to, if you're not out here in Texas, I have to stare at my computer for an hour and a half, which you know I I don't like to do. But um, it's always just beautiful, you know, catching up with you and sharing these dialogues Mm -hmm. with people. So I really appreciate you being willing to do them with me and uh, and also just everything else you do for our mission. You know, for those that don't know Bailey, uh, maybe on the first episode we did together, we probably talked about your history, but Bailey was a listener of the show. And at one point I was posting that I was hiring and uh, and she applied for the position, which at the time was just kind of an administrative catch-all assistant because I was a bit overwhelmed and there was too much for just one person to do. And then um, she's been mm-hmm. so badass that she now co-produces the show and does all kinds of higher level things without which uh, none of this would happen. So thank you. Oh, you're so welcome, Luke. And thank you for the opportunity to do it. I mean, I, this, this life, you know, working for you, um, getting to spread the truth and getting to have these conversations with you, it's such a blessing. I don't know you know, my life would be completely different without this. And um, yeah, I'm just so grateful to be a part of it. So thank you. Awesome. That makes two of us. And that makes tens of thousands mm-hmm. of other people, hopefully, that hear this episode. <laughs> yeah. All right, Bailey, until we meet again, I'll see you soon. 